This is the Body Wise Podcast. Thank you for joining Laura and Christina for another intimate exploration of collective wisdom. Hi, guys. Welcome back to Body Wise Podcast. For those listening on audio only, I'd like to let you know that we do have a video of this episode on my YouTube channel. Hi, Laura. She's here. <laughs> Hello everyone. It's good to be here. I'm sitting next to my sister, which is kind of fun because we've never recorded together in the same room, in the same space. Same so, state. Yeah. Some COVID uh, features of, of our lifestyle at this moment right. being together, which is kind of nice. It is kind of nice. Um, and Laura hasn't been on in a while, but it's really cool to um, have her back on. And we have some guests in the works that she'll be interviewing. Um, more hormone related content for you guys coming up but our I feel like our current ex- experience we are both very aware of how fortunate we are in like what we've got going on in this moment of crisis and we're ever so every day we're super grateful for that um but so we want to give you guys a little update on what's going on with us um what kind of day in the life looks like these days Um, and what's to come and lot has been working on some really cool stuff and you've been kind of MIA from body wise so fill us in girl (laughs) okay um yeah I think that I've been sort of hunkered in in a little bit of a cave mode because I felt really inspired to write out how I feel about the content that I'm passionate about and everything that I've kind of learned and um, the motivation behind the work that I do. And um, just starting to do that opened up different layers of creativity and insight. And I've just been, that. those are the nails of my mini schnauzer. And when she walks around the house, it's like that and it drives me nuts if I'm trying to sleep, but otherwise it's just interrupts our podcast. <laughs> okay. So back to what was going on. I don't have that much time to write these days. Um, I do get it in when I can, where I call windows of opportunity, which are rare because the kids are home. That being said, <laughs> despite our privilege, there is an element of a struggle to this change and to this transition that particularly for me, um, I would like to just speak to that because I think that, well, I know I'm not the only one. I did express that to some of my friends and they just reflected back to me that it really resonated with them. As a stay-at-home mom for the last, I don't know, many, many years since my first child was born and she's gonna be nine now, Um, Even though the last few years have been dedicated to study and self-development and potentially opening up my business, it's always been done during the scraps of time that I get because my first job is mom and I am the primary caretaker of my kids. Their dad is the primary breadwinner, is the primary financial provider. Um, So his work and his job takes precedence over mine and my children's needs and they take precedence over my work. So I can work, but if someone else needs me, I need to drop it and go. My work isn't protected by anyone else the way that I protect my, like their dad's work where, oh, I'll get the kids, I'll back you up, I'll make myself available so that you can come through and you can have that time. No one does that for me. And you know, there's that part of us as mothers where like, that postpartum cave survival, then growth, transitioning into motherhood, being existing only for the survival of your children, which was the case for me, the way that felt, and then slowly crawling out of that, recognizing yourself again, recreating yourself. And, you know, I've been so hungry to to work and to create and to express myself in other ways in the world outside of motherhood. And these circumstances feel like I'm backtracking and that's been tough. It's, it's, it's really tough to kind of 
out of necessity be mom again, like home base mom, let me support the people around me who are working. And at the end of the day, I'm not getting any closer to financial independence because the work that I do as raising kids, housekeeping, providing nutrition, safety, emotional support for these children in our society is not compensated, is not enumerated. We don't get paid for this work. So I still need to depend on a man or other people around me. Uh, to financially support me. And in some circles, I have nothing. I have nothing to my name, which is a really devastating thing that my father once said to me when I told him I was getting divorced. Even though I had two beautiful children, healthy, beautiful family, I didn't have anything. So She's using air quotes for those who aren't watching the video. <laughs> I am using air quotes for that. Yeah. Um, which of course I didn't agree with, but still that's like a lot of, Dagger. it is, it's a lot of work to process that and just realize, well, my values are different from societal norms and that, and that, and all of that, blah, blah, blah. but um, there is a reality to it. There is a material reality to it, a financial dependence reality to that. So and a creativity and an expression and a manifestation of who I am. So that being said, um, just voicing it is helpful. And just sharing it with the women in my life that have told me, man, I feel the same way. I feel that struggle. And so many of them are supporting their partners and raising their children and having to put themselves on hold again. I think even like moms who work like I work and I work from home but even though my income parallels my husband's or supersedes it at times I still have to be the flexible one always and I mean granted Justin's in the Navy so it's like it's the military there's no flexibility there but that's a frustration that I feel too I mean and I think that a lot of even even like work from home moms or even just women who work who are the primary caregivers but they're also breadwinners but then they also have to be always the flexible one, you know, who like, and then something always goes like, and that's what we see a lot of health issues with women too, because they're burning the candle at both ends of yeah, the stick. Something's got to give. Something's got to give. And I, I, I feel you because it is super hard to be like, I have something to give the world beyond just being an amazing mother and raising amazing humans, which by the way is I think a, a, like a service to society because the children that you're raising are not going to be assholes and they're going to be sensitive and emotionally intelligent people. And like, that's a big deal. <laughs> yes, it is. You know, they are the future. <laughs> they are the future. And so, I mean, it is, I, I agree. It's, I wish that there was, I mean, other countries do it so much better. Like the Nordic countries where um, both spouses get like 18 months of Maternity, maternity and paternity leave. Paternity, yeah. So it kind of evens out that burden. It's like that early on, it really sets the stage to like equal a co-partnership, co-partnership, co-parenting. Yeah. And we understand that some people have that, but let's be honest, it's not the common dynamic. Yeah. And I would argue that, you know, Derek and I have a very, pretty seamless co-parenting structure where we both take responsibility for the relationship we have with our children the care his involved involvement and his relationship with his daughters are just so important to him um and he does put in that time but it's never equal there's always got to be of course you know he's got to work and i've got to take care of the kids so that he can work mm -hmm. and if i want to work essentially that means starting to sneak it in here and there. And sometimes I'm too tired at the end of the day when I've had the kids all, all day, day and I'm, I have to clean up after them and just maintain the house. And I'm just tired. I'm beat. But at the same time, you know, I've been um, really looking forward to having, to having family closer, to having my mom around who's expressed that she wants to be more of a grandmother, spend more time doing that. And we'll see. That's kind of in the works. That's a complicated yeah. story. And our, a complicated yeah. process. I mean, our, so I, my, my, our mom bought a house like a block away from her house from here. And she's, my mom is, she doesn't, she doesn't express interest. I mean, she is like super grandma. She just, she lives in another city. So she's 
transitioning to Tampa full time, I also we're building a house like a block and a half away from here. And so essentially when I when we closed on that deal, my mom was like, All right, that settles it. Like all my grandbabies are gonna be in Tampa. I'm headed over there. And yeah. so yeah, we we hope that having that, I think almost and like um we talk about like that ancient ancestral like dynamic of family where it's not just mom dad kids it's like mom dad grandpa grandpa aunties like all of us raising the kids together can give all of us that support to balance out the dynamic so you can be a creator and be a businesswoman and be a mother but you're not just you're not feeling torn in so many directions because if i'm watching her kids or she's watching mine it's like the same you know it's like there's no worry of like are my kids needs being met yeah um, and I do want to add something to this for those of you who are listening and and that the my experience sort of resonates with you. Um, there are times in the day when the kids do go to their dad's house in the afternoon or a little bit in the morning for an hour and a half or so. And there's the doer creator urge that would normally like there's a part of me that wants to go into my office, sit down, crank it out, get something done. <clears throat> but then there is a there is the reality that I have learned and that is I need to take care of myself. And just like that postpartum mama and they used to say, you know, when the baby is sleeping, you should sleep, you should rest, like let everything else be what it is and take care of yourself because in order to continue being mother and nourishing you need to nourish yourself. And when I talk about feeling like I don't have that much time, it's because I'm using a lot of those windows of opportunity to take care of myself. And that could mean sitting down with a cup of tea in a quiet house and just enjoying like 30 minutes of no one asking me for food or a snack, coming, a snack or complaining about something. It also means turning on the music and moving my body dancing, stretching, um, self-pleasuring. It means going outside and breathing in like the yummy, humid Southern air, Southern air that we have right now, which I enjoy personally, but it's just like getting in touch with my body and coming back to myself. Because if I don't take the time to come back to myself, then sitting down to create something, where does it come from? It, it, I want it to come from a centered place. And even if that means that I'm only left with 20 minutes to just reread what I wrote yesterday, that's fine. Because if I don't make time to just take mm -hmm. care of myself, and yeah, it takes a shitload of time to feed yourself properly, do all the things that keep you feeling like put together, then I'm going to end up in shambles. And then it's not even worth any of it. Like that is a priority. And we forget to do that. We forget to do that because we're always doing, whether it's doing for other people or doing to create. I just want to remind everyone that coming back to you is a worthy investment. And it's just, it's been essential for me. And it's just not something that I think over time, I, I let go of it and I let go of it and I let go of it and life and my body have reminded me that no, that's a priority. No matter what's happening, you have to make that a priority. Yeah, the notion that we need to like crank it out all the time, that like, God forbid, we have self-care and time for the gym and time for meditating. No, any, any extra time you have for yourself, it has to be working. It has to be mothering or working or sleeping and that's it. It's like, that's not, that's not fair. Um, I learned that the hard way because I'm definitely, I'm a super like doer times a thousand um, and I have a hard time not doing. I'm like a busybody, but um, I do crash a off to, and then I have to really scale it back. And so um, I've learned to, you know, even my work day with, with this doctor, that with Dr. Becky Campbell, the functional medicine doctor I'm working for now, my call windows are 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. Granted, that worked out when Jack was in school because he'd go to school at nine. I'd have two hours to work out come home, shower, eat something before I started my work day. Now it's a little different because I'm using my two hour window to homeschool Jack, which kill me. But um, I, you know, I managed to get a Bruce, a walk in for Bruce and get in a meal. And so it is important. That is so important because it's like, you have to be a ultra hustler. Like, what is it like, you know, that, that whole, like that hustle mentality, like I'm a hard, hard work is like definitely 
something I, I like, I feel like it's very much a part of who I am and maybe it comes from like our parents or dad, like who knows, but not at the expense of your, of your health or your well being. I mean, Mark Sisson, we had him on the podcast, Live Awesome, and he grew this empire. And he said that he grew this empire, not missing his kids' soccer games, not the working weekends or holidays, taking, making sure he got time for himself and extra, like he put himself first, him and his family first, and yet he still was able, granted, of course, he's a guy, he's a man. But he was able to, but he never really, like, he never was missing out. Because he's like, what's the point of building this big thing when you look back and you're unhealthy and you know your the family's in shambles so yeah yeah so what have you been working on during your <laughs> windows of opportunity well um i really i really wanted to touch base with the i guess the passion behind the work that i do which i guess just to remind everyone i'm a fertility awareness educator and sexual and reproductive health educator and i was essentially driven to that training because in my life, in my experience, I've come across so many women who, and men, who are ignorant, essentially, as I was, of their menstrual cycle, of their hormonal cycle, um, the implications of their menstrual cycle to their health and wellness. And at the same time, a lot of people, so many women, my friends, my neighbors who are struggling with hormonal issues, reproductive health issues, fertility issues. Um, and in combination with that, how uncomfortable they generally feel talking about it or, have, or accessing the healthcare system or how often they were told, well, how often they were not listened to, not taken seriously, um, told, you know, just take birth control or just take Tylenol or, it's normal or it's in your head or, you know, may, after pregnancy, it'll get better. Um, or it's cause you're getting older. I mean, ridiculous responses and just sent home. And really the notion of suffering in silence as a, the standard description of women's health and health issues. And just that, that little nugget, combined with the fact that I have daughters and I know how much menstrual education, like awareness changed my perception of myself and my appreciation of my body and my confidence level of, of, around my body. Um, and the fact that, you know, girls' confidence levels drop between the ages of eight and 14 significantly by 30%. And I've read that so many times. And because I have an eight-year-old who's about to be nine, you know, it's really pre present for me. And I've bought all the books and the confidence code for girls. And I mean, I do everything that I can, but even in reading into that, in all of the research that I've done, none of the articles have attributed any of that to potential menstrual cycle education. Because the fact is this, the fact is that girls' confidence levels drop. And when it's at its lowest by age 14, boys' confidence levels are still 27% higher than girls. And this disparity, this difference is long lasting. And here's another fun fact. By the age of 14, when girls' confidence levels are at the lowest, 90% of girls in the United States have their period. They have their period. Now, if I take a survey, a wide ranging survey of women of what was their experience? What, what do they remember about getting their first period about Menarche, which is the official name for your first period? Did somebody talk to you about it? Did you know it was happening? What was the attitude around it? What were you told? You know, what, there is a, there is a narrative of shock, disgust, surprise, fear, sometimes humor, very rarely was it open, honest, safe. There was a, a mentor or a guide in a woman's life that, you know, a young girl's life that kind of walked her through it and, and really guided her into understanding, appreciation, and empowerment at that point in her, in, in her, in her change and what was happening in her body. Like that is a rarity. So really most of us, have an experience that does anything 
but instill confidence in us. And if we didn't have that personal guide, let's just look around. What are the messages that girls receive about bleeding, about their periods, about menstruation? Usually it's shame, yucky, icky, hide it, don't talk about it, gross, made fun of if anybody in middle school notices or high school. It's, it's just, you know, the taboo comes from a history, a narrative that women have received, been told, and unfortunately perpetrated ourselves, like carried on ourselves by not talking about it and considering it to be something worthless. So that being said, that being said, I think that the, I know that the conversation around periods and just uh, menstrual awareness, empowerment is growing, is changing. You know, people, more women are talking about their bodies, are using menstrual blood for art, are talking about the power of it. There are voices, there are authors, there are so many women that have inspired me to just to elaborate on this and to share this information. And it has been life changing for me. And even just the basic education around it, the fact that we're not taught this by any kind of societal institution or cultural tradition. It just doesn't exist for us. It's not reaching our 14 year olds, our 12 year olds, our 13 year olds, not yet. Um, and we live in a country where, you know, the second most common surgery in women is hysterectomy. We remove, there's 600,000 hysterectomies per year of women having their uteruses removed. 75% um, of people with autoimmune issues are women. More than half of postmenopausal women, more than half, experience a horrible term called vaginal and vulvodynial atrophy. Now, the fact that only 25% get adequate care means that there is a lot of suffering in silence in those later years. And why is this? It's because we don't talk about it. It's because most of the time, healthcare providers are not active participants in this kind of care and patients are too embarrassed and ashamed to talk about it. So there's a lot of work to be done and I'm kind of like working on tying it full circle with this is our life. We deserve to know. This is education that empowers us to be the, the keepers of our, of our lives, of our bodies and our, our, our own advocates. And, you know, it's just, it's so important to bring that back to us. And yeah, that's kind of a cluster scatterbrain version of what's going on in my head right now. <laughs> I mean, we see that a lot, even with in Dr. Campbell's practice. Um, she's a functional medicine doctor that I'm, I'm working with. Like I'm working in her practice as their in-house nutrition person, but so many women, mm -hmm. most of them who come to us with autoimmune issues or hormone issues always have the story of the doctors who didn't listen. And all they said, all they could offer was just get on birth control endometriosis, get on birth control, PCOS, get on birth control, infertility, try birth control for a while, then get off of it. It's like, what? It's like, it's not this band-aid thing. That's like the only thing they can do. And, you know, as you know, birth control, obviously, like you're not ovulating. And, you know, I just had, I just gave a supplements course. Um, and a lot of the questions I got were for postmenopausal women and about like bone density and just like aches and kind of pains that come with that. And I came to Lauda for that information. And yeah, you know, there is a lot of, there's bone loss. And of course, if you have a history of taking birth control um, and, you know, so what was it like estrogen, estrogen, estrogen boost, cr helps to create, create bone, bone and progesterone protects it, protects it. Right. So you don't lose it. So, it preserves it. But when you don't, when you're on a birth control for 20 years, you're not ovulating. And so you don't have progesterone. And so again, like then next thing you know, you're going through the change, you're going through menopause and it's, you know, you can't get back what you lost, but no one talks about, like, no one talks about the side effects. They put women on birth control without talking about the side effects, like passive blood clots. Like, oh, do you smell? Great. You know, you don't, you won't get blood clots. It's like, well, nutrient deficiencies. I mean, especially B vitamins. So it's definitely, I think, because of maybe the prevalence of autoimmune disease and so many issues that women are in, God, they get younger and younger. It's like, I mean, I know I dealt with stuff since I was a kid, but 
you know, when I first started the Castaway Kitchen, I felt like most of my audience uh, were women in their 30s, uh, 40s, 50s. But we're seeing, I'm, we're treating, you know, babies. They're 19, 20, 21, they're in college and they're dealing with chronic, chronic like horrible symptoms. Um, and of course it's like, because they don't know. And so imagine that empowerment, the same way that we know now about gut health. And so when you have a little kid that has, you know, bumpy skin or chronic diarrhea, you're just like, ah, he'll grow out of it. No, we like, okay, something's up with the gut. Let's look at his diet. We know better now. But I think that also teaching girls at a young age to understand the functions of their body um, can, is going to, it can be so empowering. And again, even just going into you know, their adulthood and experiencing this sexuality, they'll feel empowered and it won't be this like, because I, I mean, at least for us growing up, so much of like exploring sex and dating and our bodies was like kind of waiting for something to happen. Like being like this experience that was happening to us, like whether we, the like, and just an understanding our anatomy and yeah, our feelings is just, I, I, I agree. I think it's something that's severely lacking and will again, creates a future a generation of women that um you know that aren't victimized that aren't that don't feel bullied by doctors by partners you know will understand what's happening and that which is it's on so many levels it, it really will have i think a ripple effect yeah i i would hope so i think that especially in our case when you grow up and i would say I mean, I would speak for me, I feel like I was very much trained to be a pleasant girl and a pleasant woman. And, you know, that required femininity, femininity as defined by a very skewed system and as defined by men, as defined by Cuban culture. And, um, when you're caught up trying to fit the mold, a mold that comes to you from the outside, you, aren't, you don't learn to listen to yourself and you don't learn to listen to what your own desires are and what actually feels good to you. You know, because kind of what feels good to you initially is fitting in like all children go through. I just want to fit in. I just want to be considered that I look good. I fit in. People like me. People love me. I'm accepted. It's our survival instinct. And in this society, what that has meant for female bodied people is to look a certain way, act a certain way, not be too loud, not to, yes, always this, always that. And really usually in service of others and very, very little in service of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And the way our real selves and our real bodies and our real fluids and our real arousal and what that really looks like, which is not in any way represented, represented no. for us. So no. finding it, finding that blueprint in ourselves, it's tough because you're the first to see it within yourself. We don't have many examples of it. And more and more people and more and more women and feminist writers and feminist artists. Sort of. I don't know. I, I mean, yes, they are. They do. I just, I would like, I, so I, I dabbled in TikTok. <laughs> okay. No, <laughs> don't do it. I don't ever get on that shit. That's the opposite. No, I did. I get it. But I actually, I do leave it this morning. But one of the things I realized on there was that it's so highly curated. And I feel like there's, and that's again, like, the, the younger people and I got very a, a part of me got almost a little sad of like I hope that people understand this is entertainment purposes only right because you know the app's like tagline is like real people every day and it was like no like people don't like uh, like learn choreographed dances every single day of the week and like maybe now because people have nothing else to do but um, and again, it's all like filtered. It's all like, you know, makeup tutorials. It's a performance. It's a performance. They're, performance. They're performing. On a performance. Just like pornography. It is entertainment. It is not education. Right. But again, for young people, I don't know if they like can distinguish that. I don't know. It's, it was definitely a little bit. Um, I, I worry about the future of, you know, the social media and its role and how it shapes how young people, because we didn't, we, teenagers hood was hard enough and we only had like dial up AOL, you know? Um, yeah. 
So we'll see how that goes. And like the mall. The and mall. Just, the mall. And like walking past Victoria's Secret billboards or Abercrombie and Fitch billboards. Like yes. that, that was the level. Yes. And that was really, really Yeah, impactful. that was already and impactful. Like, but now it's all some, day, every day. Yeah. And like people, I mean, yeah. So we'll, I mean, obviously this is all just kind of like we're figuring yeah. it out as we go along because it's new territory yes. with our kids. But even last night, Jack, so Jack and I picked him up from Derek's house after dinner and I was, we were going back to, to, to our house. And um he he mentioned something like he doesn't like his belly that because it sticks up he was like he's like i don't you know he's like and he said something he used the word fat and he used it in a negative term and i was like well why and for me instead of saying like because i don't want to just say you're not fat because again then that still makes that word something negative so i was like jack i just talked about i think your body the way it is is the way it should be and it's perfect you know um and he's like but look at my, my, my belly it sticks out and he had just had dinner and it's true. It, ever since he was a baby, like after dinner, they get that like food, like food baby. And I was like, it's probably just dinner. Your body changes in the way you're sitting, the way you're standing, if you're breathing, if you're moving and bodies are different. And, you know, and in my head, I was like, did you hear this anywhere? Like, or like, where's this coming from? He's like, no, just, you know, me. And I, and then I'm like, of course, I probably saw him like, I was, you know, on a show or something. And then I was, and I asked him like, would you think, do you think that way about other people's bodies ever? And he was like, no. And I was like, great. Then why would you think about yours? You know, I'm like, you have to be your best advocate. Like mommy and daddy are always going to be your biggest cheerleaders. And we like love everything, but you have to wake up every day and say, I love myself just the way I am. Um, anyway, but he's, it was like, I mean, and he's seven. I know. I know. That's so tough. I, you know, and I'm just like, and he said a, said a few things like that he doesn't like his freckles. And I'm just like, where is it coming from? Because of course I see this little boy and I'm like, but you're the most beautiful boy in the world. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, how could you ever think that? What would anything in the world make you think that you're less than, but then I have to check my own language too and my own biases, because I don't want to just say, no, Jack, of course you're not fat, which, you know, he isn't, he's not an overweight kid, but Again, I have to be so careful with that language. Absolutely. You know, because I remember as a kid that was overweight growing up and like, just, it's so tough. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. Because his body might change, right? You don't want to make something. And anyways, it's, it's definitely, this is why parenting should be new, <laughs> valued more. It's so yeah. hard. <laughs> um, totally. Yeah. It's no, yeah. It's just, it's a journey with the kids and, and with ourselves you know right and the art stuff and I, I think about being like conscious of what we talk about in front of the kids like Laura and I were definitely and I asked him I'm like is that something that did you hear did you ever hear that from me or Tia Laura or, or that you know mm -hmm. because we were talking the other day in the kitchen just more about um kind of getting better to the back to the better versions of ourselves because Laura and I both I mean, even the other day, I was watching a YouTube video from two years ago, right after I came, I came off my made whole books and I was like, yeah, I felt like back then I was like, you know, like in my prime, like looking good, feeling good. And, you know, seasons of life, obviously. Um, and that was talking about, yeah, this one time I worked with a trainer where she, you know, you were saying how when you were lifting once a week, but walking every other day was like really when you felt like your best. Anyway, we were just discussing, like, I think a lot of us are going through this first few weeks of this staying at home has been tough maybe snacking a little more, eating foods that don't make you feel your best. And like, I know that there's a camp of people who are like YOLO, eat whatever you want. Um, and that's fine if that's works for you. That doesn't work for me. I get very sick. A lot of it feels pretty gross after a while. It affects our cycles. It affects our skin, our inflammation, yeah. everything. Our I have sleep. a crazy sweet tooth. I'll yeah. Just, oof. Oof. Yeah. But yeah, it makes such a huge difference when you're... Right. And so we had definitely, and I had really felt like I had found my groove in terms of like, okay, I can't lift heavy at the gym anymore. And so I'm just going to focus on walking. That's what I can do. Um, every day I can get my steps in, but I still have to adjust the way I'm eating because when I'm not training hard for an hour a day, I can't eat the, I can't eat like I eat when I train that hard and it was an adjustment, but I found my groove and I was feeling better. And then of course coming down to Tampa, which if for those who don't know, my husband was supposed to deploy to Iraq. The day he left to North Carolina, he was supposed to be gone on a plane. Justin and I are halfway through like North Carolina. And then Justin's like, I'm back home. They sent me back. I'm not leaving yet. And we're like, ah, but I drove down with my son and my dog um, to be here in Tampa because of course my husband was supposed to be in Iraq and my mom has this empty house a block away from my sister it was the perfect situation. So we could co-parent during this whole thing with the kids. And so after they're done with the schoolwork, we'd have this amazing resource of Lada's big yard and the pool and Jack would have his cousins. Whereas my only child back in Virginia stuck in the house all day was 
driving everybody crazy. Yeah, and she can work at, mm-hmm. in right. the quiet house without. The right, because if not, it would have been like Jack on babysat by the TV while I got work done. Um, because I'm on call, so I can't be like, excuse me. Um, anyway, so that's why we're down here. But again, the transition down here, there was a few days where it was like we had Jack's birthday, Leah's birthday, her daughter's. So two birthdays back to back. And granted, we made like paleo treats and stuff. You made that tart. I made that. She made this chocolate tart, tart from my paleo patisserie. So good. It was Derek's birthday. And again, it's kind of nice because even in our tiny little, like our little family group that we have down here, we can do the celebrations. And of course we made, but yeah, I was like one too many paleo baked treats. And then like, I think I got a little happy with the cheese, but whatever. <laughs> and then I was like, you know what? I got to scale it back a bit. Cause I'm not feeling so good. Like I had joint pain and um, I just, I didn't feel well. So, but I, then I think of, I hope that I was worried about like even Jack hearing that conversation, mm. although we weren't really talking negatively of our body or anything like that I just always wonder because you know kids hear everything yeah. and you really want to be conscious of not you know and I don't think we use that kind of vernacular like no. we don't we don't pinch our thighs and say it grows or say I want to lose fat we you know no I think it I think we use it more in terms of how we feel right like do I feel good do I feel strong do I feel like I'm digesting well I'm resting well I have energy right my skin because sometimes it's it's it really is an energy thing for me right. especially um yeah and even though I there's a part of me that appreciates kind of slowing down in the sense that I don't have to rush my kids to school they go to a little Montessori school around here and then pick them up and the drop-offs like in terms of rhythm I am a slow person and especially next to this one over here like but I am a slow like turtle person it's turtle in the hair turtle in the hair but and i i don't exist online very much i don't i don't get on social media i don't look it's way too overwhelming for me so i am like happiest in a quiet space where i can read i can write i'm just like take it all in <laughs> i think it gets Christina anxiety oh, when i talk yeah. about that <laughs> um but i you know one of the things that has happened is that when I am more of on a hustle bustle driving around here and there, picking up, dropping off the kids and just because of life having to move faster. And granted, I am a slow person by nature. It's my true nature, but I have opened and run and worked in restaurant businesses sure. for many, many years. And I can move fast, multitask, do the rush and I'm good at it. However, just like we said, even though I can do it, I do pay the price. Mm. It isn't what my body prefers. It isn't what my, it isn't what nourishes me. It will break me down and I will have migraine headaches and it'll just come out in a different way. But I'm just kind of like looking forward to reclaiming my pace and Mm. my self, even though it doesn't match with mainstream requirements. Right. This is who I am. I want to take it slow and I want to take it in at my pace. And yeah. And I think a lot of people can honor that more. I mean, I need to slow down a little bit and I've worked toward that. Like what, after this last book launch that coronavirus just explosion in my face became, I realized that going at that pace is like, you know, is it, while I enjoy it, is it worth, you know, everything else? It was just tough. Like my book came out March 10th and that's the week coronavirus came came to the U S and two years of working so hard nonstop. Like it was like travel and just planning. And it was just just long, like months of long, long days at a time for it to just be like, like, I was just like left, like, like kind of like, Cause I like the idea is like you plan for that and you work really hard. So then you have the payoff and then you can coast. And then like, there was no coasting. It was like, shoo. and it continues to be a thing. I mean, definitely like my book is still out in the world. Sales are dismal and it's an emotional process, like letting go of that and just thinking like, well, now I work two years on something I'm not seeing any income from. So now I have to make up that income somewhere else. And that's part of the reason I started working with Dr. Campbell. I saw this opportunity and I thought, 
This is great. And it, what I've liked about it, while it's hard for me to work out on someone else's schedule, that's what I've noticed. I can go, 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 but I'm better at it on, on my own schedule. Having structure imposed on me is a little hard because mm. I definitely thrive in chaos. So I having this, like I have scheduled calls. I don't make my own schedule. They make my schedule. I wake up every day. I check the portal. I look at the, the patient files, but it has also allowed me to not do so much. Some days all I do are the calls and I don't get any blog work done. Um, so now I'm just like, if I can get one recipe on the blog a week, one newsletter out, um, we can record an episode a week. That'd be amazing. And then just my calls. And that already sounds like a lot, but, um, like I feel like I could do that for now. And that could be my new normal, um, until the next thing, which I don't know what that's going to be, but I definitely feel called to be a little bit less on social media. I think, especially after just everything, I'm just, I'm like mending a broken heart about all of it. Um, but I feel that I'm an extrovert and I need in-person connection. And so, um, I think that I need to focus on my day-to-day -day revolving around in-person connections and not just online or over the phone. Granted being here with the family has been amazing. It's like, that's like my antidepressant, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it's, and it's, and having the support and Jack, like, you know, loves it. And he has so much fun with his cousins. And as an only child, it's extremely important to me that, you know, he won't have a sister. And so, and that the girls will be like his sisters and that's important. Um, yes. That he has them. Yeah. And it's an interesting dynamic. It's fun. Cause he's so loud and slow, super like, vibey. And then like, I'm already high intensity and Jack's high intense. And then on top of that, he's like, very masculine my son in a lot of ways and he's loud and crashes and this and just his mind and the contrast between loudest girls and jack is interesting sometimes yes it's a, but is it it's fun to see them kind of navigate it no, learning about each other more and developing those relationships it's not just a visit it's a long stay they're seeing each other every, every day, day. and just like sister relationships have their ups and downs yeah, and they you, fight yeah and but that's okay because yeah. they still love each other and they want to see oh, yeah, each other yeah. more. But, you know, I think it also teaches them a lot about themselves and what right. their boundaries are and what they're okay with and what they're not okay with. For how sure. to communicate that in Jack a way that... Jack doesn't have someone yeah. messing with him every day. And he <laughs> to explain to him, like, if you, having a sibling is like having someone mess with your stuff and you and push your buttons every day, essentially. Yeah. And he doesn't have that. So he can be super sensitive to those kind of things. He gets, like, super offended easily because he doesn't have people messing with him every day. But now he hopefully this experience and um, yeah, our house is being built like as we speak. So every day I walk Bruce, my dog, and we, I walk by the house and we've seen it come up and now there's windows and we're picking out the paint and I just bought amazing kitchen appliances. And um, it's exciting because I think that I'll be so invested in the house because I literally will know where everything is and the, the wires and the bones. Um, but because it's our first forever house. Yeah. It's like my first like house that we own. Justin and I've never bought property before. And, you know, I, yeah it's the house that we'll like be in for the foreseeable future once we move in and uh, you know making it how we want it and the fact that it's so close like we're walking distance yeah walking distance that's it's awesome like amazing it is like it a is. short it's short like a walk. little triangle yeah it's like and and I think that that sense of security in terms of like our kids knowing that they have this like that net and that closeness I think will in this hard world, give them a little bit of a hug. Yeah. Because despite our family, um, like we've had, we had an amazing family. Like, yes, there were some things that were definitely like typical Latin kind of social expectations for better or, or for, for worse. worse. But we had that, we had this like bulletproof kind of family net. Like there was never a there was no bot, rock, there was a net, there was no rock bottom. Like there, we knew that someone would always catch us, you know? Yes. Were we terrified? Absolutely. Our mom was scary. Like our dad, our dad was super scary, scary. but that also kept us from messing up too, like, too bad, especially me. Um, but I, a bit, I try to explain that to, to people, like to even my husband, cause you know, to Justin, it's like, but knowing that there'd always be someone there, like you could, show up and be like I've lost everything and I've lost every possession every dime I've had and you wouldn't be out in the cold 
That's true. And I want our kids to know that too. Absolutely. That even if they're, he's, they're so mad at you when the girls are teenagers and they're like, I hate my mom. I want a mirror. They can come to my house, you know, yeah. or they can go to their Allah's house. And hopefully they don't say that, but I'm sure they will because there was always a reckoning. Always. A always. Reckoning. I know it. I know it. I'm, we have like, I mean, it, we, were, we weren't difficult. We were a little difficult teenagers. Yes, yes. There, it's there were back. challenges. <laughs> there were challenges. It's going to come back at some point. Yeah. And because we are raising strong women, children. Absolutely. Oh, my yeah. God. Oh, I love it. I'm so Her youngest, excited. youngest, I'm terrified. <laughs> yeah. I'm very excited about that. I, I just can't wait to see them out there in the world, like, <laughs> fully empowered, informed, wow. just supported. And still, I'm up against, we're up against a lot because there's still... Yeah deep-seated cultural implications to the conditioning of girls oh for sure however having that kind of like infusion that hopefully we're giving our children now right. to really really open that up. and they're going to be of a different time too they're going to be they're going to be teaching us eventually oh for they're sure i mean there's so definitely more gender us. fluidity now and i it's love more it accepted and i love it too and i think that giving kids the space to like on their own experience that not because you're teaching it to them, but because they, it's inherent in them yeah. and we're just not putting up the boundaries. I think that's going to be really exciting. And yeah, I think that it's like the evolution. Like my mom did better with us than what was done for her. And then we're, we're just kind of trying to improve it and making a million mistakes along the way. Of course, especially probably right now. Um, <laughs> but we're, you know, we're definitely, we're doing the best we can. And I know all of you out there are also doing the best you can. Um, yeah. yeah. So we, before we go, I wanted yes. to say, yeah. So I, I taught a supplements one-on-one course. I did, showed it on my newsletter. It was amazing. We did it via Zoom video, private call. It went great. I'm going to be doing, we're going to be doing more of these. Laura has a phenomenal kind of like intro to understanding your cycle your period your body yeah kind of maybe like a cycles and sex 101 right because it's it's a basic anatomy and physiology that we were never taught right that you know you didn't learn this at school and for the most part most women that i meet don't know this information so i would love to do a course on that because it's the foundational stuff that rocked my world right and i want to share it yeah. with as with you all so yeah so yeah. sign up for my newsletter on the blog. Um, I always like release like new recipes and new podcast episodes. But again, that's where I'm going to do the sign up for do this. So okay. the Castaway Kitchen blog, we'll collect the emails. And then that way we'll do a video. It's going to be right on Zoom. And um, yeah, it's an hour long course. We'll set a, t a time and date and get you guys more details. But going forward, that's such a great platform where it's kind of privatized off social media way to create content that we can get into the like, nitty gritty rock and roll kind of stuff and like not be censored by like, yeah. you know, the powers that be out there censoring everybody these days. Um, I love teaching classes. She's a very good teacher. Yeah. I may not be the extrovert like this sister is, but I'm, I'm all about education and exchanging information and circles and groups. And yeah, yeah. those like really um, just infused experiences. I can't do a lot of small talk, but I can, I could do that that other stuff. <laughs> do you want to read the thing you wrote about Abu? No. Really. No. Okay. <laughs> she's in writing. Yeah. I, I, because I, I've already changed it so much. Oh my god. Okay. She's working on this other writing project. We'll share in the future. We will share in the future. It's just like small snippets of our family stories. Short we stories. Raised. Short stories are very like matriarch family of women, immigrant, just lots of adventure stories. But she wrote this like little piece on my grandmother, who was like this like stoic, just regal regal hard regal ass woman. <laughs> yeah. so yeah. yeah i'm very excited about that as well me like too a little family anthology thing yes so we'll share more about that coming will, soon for sure. all right well thanks everyone um we'll hopefully record we'll be here for a few months more of these video episodes so if you're watching yeah. on audio um remember to check out youtube for the video remember to leave your reviews please yeah. and tell us what you like tell yeah. us what you liked a lot or what you want to hear more about right I'd also, the last episode with L. Russ, we announced the winner of the giveaway who won a copy of Made Whole and the $50 Whole Foods gift card. So make sure to listen to the episode. It's in the beginning if, to see if you are the winner. Bye, everybody. Bye.